The Lord Jesus Christ who died on a cross and shed his blood, that through the blood of the Lamb of God, all of us have been set free and we're ushered into the place of blessing where God has called us to live. That's what the promised land means for us. Would you like to have freedom, fullness, and fulfillment in every area of your life? Think about those three words for a moment. As Christians, we trust in God for freedom from our sins. We pray that He gives us fullness through His Holy Spirit and through His love and grace. And we continually ask Him for fulfillment of the promises that He has made in His Word. The promised land which God promised to Abraham was a place of salvation and victory. It meant freedom, fullness, and fulfillment for Abraham and all of his descendants. In today's message, we're going to look at three important lessons from Joshua chapter one, when the baton of leadership was passed from Moses over to Joshua in order to lead the Israelites into the promised land you will learn why God's Word should be in your mouth and on your mind and followed always. So make sure you have your Bible and your notes and let's dive into our lesson today. You are going to be blessed. Take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one, today, I want to talk to you and address the topic of the promised land, trusting and believing in that place of true blessing. Dr. Martin Luther King referred to the promised land in his heart as that place where our country would have racial equality. And so the promised land is a metaphor for many things, but I want to talk about the promised land as we see it in the Bible. Recently, uh, on a television show called Jeopardy, and there's a guy named Ray Reynolds who grew up in this church. Uh, he's a cameraman for Jeopardy for many, many years. But uh, just recent, there was a social media uproar over a question concerning the city of Bethlehem. The category was, where's the church? Where's the church? And the question was, which was the final question in the first round, were $200. Alex Trebek, the clue was, built in the 300s AD, the Church of the Nativity. And again, where's the church? And the first contestant, a lady named Katie Needle, answered, what is Palestine? And Alex Trebek said, that's incorrect. And then the second contestant, Jack McGuire, said, what is Israel? And that was deemed correct. Well, then there was an uproar because of political correctness. They actually reversed and took the points away from the guy that said Israel and gave it to the points to the person who said Palestine. Now, there will always be a debate as long as time shall last between the Jews and the Arab nations on who owns that land. And I want you in your notes to write down a few things about that land. First of all, it was originally promised to a man named Abraham. Now, uh, you have to go back in a timeline. Uh, I know most of you are young, but you have to go back 4,000 years to know who that land belongs to. And uh, in your Bibles, in Genesis chapter 12, that's the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, we find these words. This is 4,000 years ago. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's household, and go to the, the what? The land that I, God, will show you. 
And when you get there, verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And down in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 12, they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So the Lord was the one who gave that land to Abraham, and originally, write this down, it was the land of Canaan. That's what it was called. It was called the land of Canaan. And you'll know this, it's very easy to figure this out. That's where the Canaanites lived. Uh, the Canaanites lived in Canaan. And God decides, don't be upset with God, he decides to take the land from the Canaanites and he decides to give it to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants. Now, always people say, well, why would God do that? Well, the simple answer, God can do whatever he wants to do. God was the one that created the land. You say, whose land is it? It's God's land. God could have given it to Fred Flintstone if he'd wanted to. But he decides to give it to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants. Now, the best answer on why God did that was because God has a plan. God is going to raise up a people, uh, the Jewish people. He's going to raise up this nation. He's going to plant them in that land. And from that land eventually will come the Messiah. And the Messiah will be the one who can redeem the entire world. Now, God could have chosen any people. He could have, he could have done all this in Simi Valley if he'd wanted to. But God is God, and God is the one who chose that particular land. And that's why it's called, write it down, that's why it's called the promised land. Because originally, it was the Canaanites, but God told Abraham that he, he's going to lead him to a place. And so this place is called, as we know in our vernacular, as the promised land. It was part of God's unwavering covenant or promise to Abraham and to Abraham's offspring. Now, I want to give you a long story short, and this story is almost 500 years long, okay? So just be patient with me. It'll take me just a couple of minutes to tell you a 500-year-long story. The Israelites, because of a series of events, they end up as slaves down in northern Africa, an area that we know today as Egypt. And they were there for 430 years as slaves. And God wants to fulfill his promise. So he raises up a man by the name of Moses. And through a series of plagues, uh, finally Moses leads one 0.5 million Hebrews out of Egypt and into the promised land that he had promised back in Genesis chapter 12. So for 430 years, they were enslaved. For 430 years, they were in bondage. For 430 years, they were in Egypt. And you know the, you know the final plague of those 10 plagues. God said to take a lamb just a little lamb, and take the blood of that lamb and put it on the tops and the sides of the door. This is down in Egypt. And he said, I'm going to send my death angel. And if you have the blood on the tops and the sides of the door, the death angel will pass over your house. No harm. But if you refuse to take the blood and you don't put the blood of the lamb on the doors of, of frame of your house, my death angel will come inside that house and kill the firstborn male child of every household. And it was the final plague where Pharaoh said, oh, that's enough, I'm done. God's people, the Hebrews, you can go, you can go. And so it was through that, the, the, the blood of the lamb that the people were eventually set free. Now, the journey from Egypt to the promised land should have taken 11 days. That's all it should have taken. But because of sin, after they left Egypt... The Bible says they had to wander around the wilderness for 40 years. So now you're up to 470 years. They're still not in. But eventually they get to the edge of the Jordan River. And they're going to cross over. 
and to the promised land. And they send in 12 spies. And 10 of those 12 spies come back and go, we can't do this. It's, it's, there's giants in there. We can't. And two, guys, we can do this. Take this leap of faith. With God, we can conquer. And so uh, they send in the spies, but all the spies come back. They all said this. Oh, this land, write this down. It's flowing with milk and honey. It is a rich uh, land. In other words, they're no longer going to have to be in the desert. Now they get dessert. <laughs> it's lush. It's the abundance of God, the blessing of God. And then God tells Moses, Moses, you're not going to get to lead him into the promised land. And he chose a young man by the name of Joshua. And uh, if you read, don't do it now, but sometime this week, you want, I mean, this is better than television, people. Read the first six chapters of Joshua. And it's the story of the Hebrew people crossing over the River Jordan and going in and taking possession of this land that's called the Promised Land. Joshua and the Hebrew people and the 12 tribes of Israel, which were the 12 great grandsons of Abraham, God fulfilling his promise. We have the names of those 12 tribes on the 12 pillars outside of this church if you want to go read their names. They cross over the Jordan River and they take possession of the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and they're finally where God had called them to be. Now spiritually, write this down, it's symbolic of salvation, symbolically. Because all of us here at one time were slaves. All of us were in bondage to sin, to our past. And it wasn't just a little lamb. It was the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and shed his blood, that through the blood of the Lamb of God, all of us have been set free and we're ushered into the place of blessing where God has called us to live. That's what the promised land means for us. And write this down, which is what I wanna to talk to you about today. The promised land is a place of victory. It's a place of victory. And as a believer today, you should be living a life of victory. You should not be living a life of defeat. Now I wanna show you this photograph. This is a, a drawing or a map this is the land of Israel. Uh, this is the 12 tribes who, who God, after 500 years, brought them to this land. And you can see where the 12 tribes, and you can see Judah. You see Judah there? Uh, Judah, the tribe of Judah, is where Jesus came from. The Messiah came from there. And if it wasn't for the Messiah, none of us would be here today. Amen? Amen. Now, for all the Hebrew people who finally got to that place, of victory, it meant three things. Number one, it meant freedom for them. They were no longer slaves, no longer in bondage, no longer in Egypt, no longer in the world, no longer in the desert. It was a place of freedom. Number two, it was a place of fullness. They've now entered a land of hills and valleys and rivers and fruit and wine and oil, figs and grapes and pomegranates and blessing, abundance, overflowing, with milk and honey, amen. Instead of eating the same manna day after day, week after week, month after month for 40 years, piece of bread, now they have mangoes and grapes and avocados and tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and zucchini and apples and pears and bananas and dates and on and on the list goes. But number three, most importantly, it, it, it was a place of fulfillment it was the place where God began to fulfill his promises and his plans. They were now living in the will of God. And you have to understand this. I'm going to illustrate this to you. It isn't about the soil. It's not about the dirt or the land per se. It's about their role. God's eternal plan was to use them to bring forth a Messiah that would one day redeem the world. 
I want you to say 25 years ago. Say that. 25 years ago, this year, I was preaching at a little church down Rinaldi called Hillcrest Christian Church. We had a little tiny building. We had eight pews. I used to count them like every day. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we had four sections. Section, section, section. We had eight pews. And in that little building, we were running 1,000 people. He said, come on, pastor. We were running 1,000 people. He said, how'd you do that? We had multiple services. That's why I'm bald today. I wore myself out preaching just multiple times Saturday nights and multiple times Sunday mornings and there were many times people didn't know this that I was discouraged because I felt like God had called me out here to this city to win this whole city to the Lord and I'd show up and that building was packed and we'd go service after service after service and I just thought Lord am I gonna did you bring me out here to spend the rest of my time in this little tiny building but we just kept going Meanwhile, I knew nothing about any of this stuff. There was a man named Dr. Jess Moody. And Dr. Moody was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Van Nuys, California. At one time, it was the largest Sunday school in the entire United States of America. It was a storied church. And one day, Jess decided to sell his building to Jack Hayford in Church on the Way. So Jack Hayford on Church on the Way, they now have an East Campus and a West Campus over on Sherman Way. Dr. Moody came out here to this piece of property. There were about 15 acres here. There was nothing here. There were no stores. There were no houses. There was no Starbucks, no In-N-Out, nothing. Rinaldi was a dirt road, and it had a dead end on this property. Every, there was nothing here except some... Uh, sheep and some shepherds, which is where the name came from. But Dr. Moody had a vision that one day this northwest corner of the San Fernando Valley that there'd be thousands and thousands of people and these hills would be covered with homes and there would be restaurants and stores right across the street. He had a vision for that. Now, not, not everyone had that vision, but he had a vision. And for him, this was like the promised land for him. So they came out and they built a building. Most people in that church left. They quit. They said it's too difficult, too expensive. But there were about five or 600 people who stayed with Dr. Jess Moody. These were people of faith. Let me tell you, it was a dirt end, a, a, dead, a, de a dead end, a dead end. And they built the building that's now the children's area. This building wasn't here. The parking structure wasn't here. The gymnasium was not here. There's only one building. They built the, the building on the far end, which is now our children's area. And uh, the church struggled. And one day I was down at Hillcrest in my little office in my little church, and there was a, a knock on the door. And in walked Dr. Jess Moody. It, he, look, he reminded me of John Wayne. <laughs> he was larger than life character, if you knew Mr. Moody. He was 70 years old. And he said, Dudley, he goes, what do you think about merging our two churches? And so we began this process of talking through what would it look like if we merged. His church was a Southern Baptist church, and our church was a Christian, independent Christian church, what that would look like. You can't get two churches to merge in the same denomination. I, I mean, this was a step of faith. And we had come up with this plan where he was going to let me preach every Saturday night because he didn't have Saturday night service, so he didn't care if I wanted to preach Saturday night. We were gonna, I, he was going to let me preach Saturday night every week and Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And then he would preach every Sunday at 11 o'clock. So all of his people could hear him, all my people could hear me. And once a month, he was gonna let me preach all three services. That was kind of the plan. And one morning I couldn't sleep. It was five o'clock in the morning. I just, you know, I, I just, I'm gonna go eat breakfast. 
because I have to have breakfast. How many, how many breakfast people we got out there? I can skip lunch. I don't need dinner, but I have to have breakfast. So I went to a restaurant called Coco's. It's no longer there. It's where Chick-fil-A is now over on Devonshire. Used to be a Baker Square. And it, used to be, it used to be a Coco's right over there. And I, I walked in at 5 o'clock in the morning. Ain't nobody there. And I walked in, and here's Dr. Jess Moody sitting in a booth. He's got a stack of pancakes about that high. I walked in, he was pouring a whole barrel of, of uh, syrup over those pancakes. And he looked up and he saw me. He said, Pastor Dudley, sit down. And he said these words to me. He said, you know, I've been thinking. He goes, I'm 70 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I, there's not going to be this co-pastor thing. He goes, I'm leaving. And he goes, if you want the church, you can have it. And he, he said, there's only one problem. I go, what's that? He goes, we have a $9 million debt on the building. <laughs> he goes, you can have the land and you can have the building, the one building, but it's going to cost you $9 million if you want it. I said, who owns the note? As a, ban as a banker down in Long Beach, California, as a family-owned bank in Long Beach, California, who had loaned them the money, the land and the building had cost $16 million to build. And... Uh, he said, we owe nine, and he goes, we're going in the hole $50,000 a month. We're going backwards. And so I, I, I know nothing. My buddy Klaus, he's a businessman out here. I'm not a businessman. I went to Bible college. What do I know about business? And so I said, let me go talk to us. So I went down to Long Beach, and I found this guy. We went into his bank. It was like going back to the wild, wild west. And uh, he said, let's go downstairs. We went underneath. I thought it was a mafia or something like this. Is a, no one's ever going to see me again. And we go down the basement, and I, his name is Mr. Walker, and, and I said, Mr. Walker, I said, we can't afford your, the $9 million because the church had, was going to be foreclosed on. And he said, uh, he said, well, what can you pay? <laughs> well, I don't know how to, I hadn't even thought about that. And uh, my favorite number is seven because it's the Lord's number. And, uh, and I, I said, uh, seven million? And uh, he and he goes. He, I go, but I can't afford the payment on seven million. And uh, he goes. He goes. He goes. I'll set you up with a rent payment uh, where you pay a rent. Is so he goes. I still own it, so I'll just rent it to you for three years. And he goes. At the end of that three years, the nine million has grown to nine and a half. You'll owe me nine and a half million. But he said, if you don't miss a single payment for three years. I will sell you that building for $7 million. That whole meeting took 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, he gave us two and a half million dollars to a man I'd never met before. And the next three years, we did not miss a single payment. And at the end of those three years, he sold $16 million worth of land and a facility to, to, the, to us for $7 million. I had, there was one guy on the staff who told a friend of mine, who told me. He did not know that I knew. But this guy who was on a staff here said, this will never work. This merger will never work. Pastor Dudley will never work. This whole thing, these two churches getting together, this whole thing is going to go under. And here we are 25 years later. That guy was the first guy we fired, just so you know. As soon as we fired him, the church just took off. <laughs> but honestly, when I was in that meeting with Dr. Moody with those pancakes, it was like he was saying to me, Dudley, I, I am, I'm like Moses, and I, I brought this church out here. We're on the edge of this thing. He goes, but I'm done. It's, it's not mine. It's, it's time for you to take this thing to the next level. People do not know this, but Dr. Moody had shown me in his drawings, he had a drawing of a large auditorium like this. And in a sense, I just want you to know this, that when I left that uh, little church and we finally came down here and we merged, in many ways, I felt free at that time. I can't explain it to you. I felt like I was trapped and not able to fulfill all that God had for, my, for me in my life. So then I came down here, I also felt the fullness of God. I, I, I just felt like this was a place of blessing. And uh, God has certainly blessed us the last 25 years. Can you say amen to that? But most, but most importantly, I felt fulfillment like this was all God's plan. Hey, listen, God, God has a plan. 
for each of us. And he's going to carry this plan out uh, in its fullest. And it took a leap of faith. It was a leap of faith. We did not know how it was going to turn out. But we took that leap of faith, expecting that God was going to be with us each step of the way. It has nothing to do, stay with me, it has nothing to do with this building. It has nothing to do with the soil and the dirt and the land that's underneath this building. It has to do with this being a place of reverence, a place where God's purpose is being fulfilled for our church and for our city. You've got Hollywood, you've got Los Angeles, this very wicked, very worldly city, and it was like God carved out these 16 acres and said, this area is an area that's going to be used for my purposes and for my glory to reach this great city called Los Angeles. I hope that today's message inspired you to be strong and courageous in the Lord and to cherish the Bible, His Word. If you've been blessed in any way by the Lift Up Jesus program, we would love to hear from you. Check us out online at liftupjesus.com or give us a call at the phone number on the bottom of your screen. And please tune in next week as we continue our series, Leaping in Expectation. I'll be sharing my heart on how you and I can build something great for God. You won't want to miss it. But until then, I want to encourage you that wherever you are and whatever you're doing, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. Hey, thank you for joining in today in our program. I don't know about you, but I just love our program. I love lifting up the person of Jesus Christ. I say this all the time. I think we have the best name for any television ministry going, to lift up Jesus. We need people like you who watch this program, who believe in this program, who understand the intent of our heart to come alongside and to support this ministry. And I know that some of you can do a little, some can do a lot. It's whatever God puts on your heart. But together, I know we can make a difference. We get letters from people all over this country. If we've blessed you, we want to hear from you. But I want to encourage you today that if this ministry has been something that has changed your heart or kept you on the right path or helped you out in some way spiritually, as it's helped you, I know it will help others if only we can get this broadcast on other stations around this country. I want to thank all of you who've ever done anything to help support this ministry. We would not be here without our partners, but we'd like to encourage others to come along and join us. And thank you again for tuning in to Lift Up Jesus and together as we lift him up, I know that we will change this world because Jesus is the light of this world and he'll change each and every heart.